we'll begin with one very common idea that's built into our common sense, which is that the world, the physical world, consists of two aspects, respectively form and matter. This was foisted on us by Aristotle and also by the Bible because it is said that God created man out of the dust of the earth and as it were made a figurine in his own image and then breathed the breath of life into its nostrils so that this form of clay became a living being. And so underneath that lies the notion that everything material is made of some sort of basic stuff like clay is the basis of pots. And for centuries, scientists, philosophers wanted to know what is that stuff? What are we made of? Now look here, a carpenter makes tables out of wood and a potter makes pots out of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood? Obviously not. A tree is wood. It's not made of it. Is a mountain made of rock? Obviously not. It is rock. See, our language contains innumerable ghosts. Supposing I say, the lightning flashes. Surely the flashing is the same as the lightning. There is not one thing called lightning and another called flashing. The lightning is the flashing. It is raining. What is this it that is raining? The raining. I can make a noun out of a verb any time by turning it into a gerund. So we populate the world with ghosts, which arise out of the structure of our language, and thus, therefore, of the structure of our thinking, because we think in language or in figuring in numbers. And so it's of intensely fascinating investigation to find out what are the hidden assumptions that underlie language and figuring. In other words, language and mathematics. And here is this basic assumption, you see, that is almost with us all. It comes again and again into our everyday speech that form, pattern, organization, organisms are made of something. As if there were some inert, primordial, and of course stupid stuff which had to be put into shape by an energy and an intelligence other than the stuff. Like the intelligence of the potter shapes the clay. So therefore, we have a basic picture of the world in which everything is being pushed around. There's a boss. There's somebody in charge who is different from what that somebody is in charge of and puts everything into shape. Because our common sense does not allow that things shape themselves. Very odd. In Chinese, the word for nature is ziran, which is that which is so of itself, the spontaneous. The Chinese have no difficulty in thinking about nature as self-shaping. A Chinese child would not ask its mother, how was I made? It would ask its mother, how did I grow? Which would be quite different, you see. So to be made is to be commanded, and therefore every good being obeys, whether you obey God or whether you obey the laws of nature, you obey. And the an analog, therefore, of the world that has been put into our common sense is one of military command. Note that. Because the image of God, 
I would go further and say the idolatrous image of God, which has been handed down to us, is one of the beneficent tyrant, the boss. Big Papa. So then, when our physicists started to find out what stuff was, they went into it and into it and examined it with ever more minute instruments. They first started cutting up things with knives and cutting them smaller and smaller and smaller until the particle that they wanted to dissect was exactly the same width as the edge of the knife. And so they got an atom. And that word in Greek, atomos, means the non-cuttable. A non tomos cuttable. That's the basic atom. What you can't cut anymore, because you got down to the end. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. So they got an atomos, in other words, a particle of something or other that was just the same width as the blade of the, the, ed, the knife edge, and they looked at it under a microscope. And they saw that it was, seemed to be composed of more small particles. So they found out means of working those out, and then they found out extraordinary means of uh, investigating the properties of matter. Then they reached a point where they couldn't decide whether it was particles or whether it was waves. So they called them wavicles. They thought they had come to certain ultimate wavicles called electrons. But then, unfortunately, everything fall, fell apart and they found protons, mesons, and many other uh, extraordinary things. Because, of course, what they didn't realize was that as you make more and more powerful microscopic instruments, the universe has to get smaller and smaller in order to escape the investigation. Just as when the telescopes become more and more powerful, the galaxies have to recede in order to get away from the telescopes. Because what is happening in all these investigations is through us and through our eyes and senses, the universe is looking at itself. And when you try to turn around to see your own head, what happens? You see? It runs away. You never get at it. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. This is the principle. Shankara explains it beautifully in his commentary on the Kena Upanishad, where he says that that which is the knower, the ground of all knowledge, is never itself an object of knowledge, just as fire doesn't burn itself. So there's always that profound mystery that you are never going to be in absolute control of what goes on. There always is the mystery. Uh -uh. The thing we don't know, as Van der Leeuw put it, the mystery of life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. If there were not that, there would be no life.